Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the Beneficent, the Merciful, I would like to welcome all of you with the universal greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon all of you. Shalom alaikum. I hope I, hope I said that right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm so honored to, to meet all of you, and I hope we, there's time uh, during the event and after for us to really get to know each other. But again, on behalf of MCC, I welcome you as well. Um, this discussion actually came about with a, a conversation that Munir and I had about you know, this particular event and what topic would interest um, hopefully all of you and us. And I kind of just shared some of my experiences um, speaking with different groups within the Muslim community from women, from youth and uh, couples, family, uh, married uh, 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 couples, and the feedback that I've gotten about just what they expect from their community center. And I've found in just the past maybe 10 or so years, uh, post 9-11, I would say actually, post 9-11, that there's been this interesting um, you know, trend of even though we have an increase actually in mosque attendance and even mosque building, I think the m most recent research that I read was that we have over 2,100, maybe close to 2,200 mosques throughout the country. Um, that there was also this other phenomenon happening uh, within our own community, within the Muslim community, of some people feeling what, uh, this term that has kind of gotten a little popular um, recently, unmosked. Okay, I don't know, have you, has anybody heard of this term before? Unmosked. Um, yeah, and this, this is a, something that has kind of come about, um, again, within the recent years. And the feedback that I got from people who felt unmasked, which what does that mean, is that they felt that some of the issues that they wanted to talk about or that they felt needed to be addressed weren't being addressed in the mosque, and that they felt that there wasn't a space for them in the mosque. So what was happening, uh, because they had a need and they still wanted to identify with their faith and they wanted to commune with their faith, they, there were these other spaces that were being created called third spaces. And this was sort of this intersection where people could come uh, without really feeling um, maybe um, judged for having differing views or um, you know maybe uh, expressing their faith a little differently than maybe what would be considered normal. So they felt that you know these th we were seeing this pop up of, of what we call third spaces. So um, the conversation again that I've heard from people is because they felt that some of the issues again that they wanted the mosque to address um, weren't being addressed. So. What happened in the communities that I've been a part of, and I lived in Southern California for a few years and then recently came back to the Bay Area, is that the conversation got started, right? And this was uh, people really wanting to now hear from uh, the youth, from the millennial generation especially, from women more, like what, what needs are you, uh, do you have that, that you don't feel maybe there's something going on in your community that, there aren't, that isn't being met? What are these things? And uh, I was part of like a really great debate actually between um, a, an imam of a mosque and myself, and we had this debate in Southern California about, you know, is our third spaces necessary? You know, are they actually causing a conflict, or is it causing confusion for people because now they kind of have to choose between attending a mosque or attending a third space? So it was just a really great debate, but out of that came a lot of understanding because finally this generational divide, right, of maybe a more traditional, uh, older, you know, um, attitude about certain things, conservative attitude uh, that a lot of the the mosque, uh, I would say, um, you know, um, management or, or, or the board, you know, the, the people who are the leadership of the mosque that they held, and then the youth who were identified as American, who were very proud still to be Muslim, but they also wanted certain things to be addressed. Um, for example, gender relations, right? As some of you may know, in Islam, there, uh, there are very clear rules about how you know, men and women interact with each other. And some of those rules don't always, um, I should say, uh, um, you know, they, they don't always align with the society at large, right? The society at large says, you know, especially when it comes to friendships or, or other relationships, that there should be a more sort of fluid, you know, um, you know, approach. Whereas in Islam, it's pretty defined as how certain things, you know, are done. And so the youth are confused, right? They're born in the society, they, they appreciate um, a lot of the great things of American society, but then this other message is confusing them. So these types of discussions were things that they weren't really getting, that weren't, they felt weren't getting addressed. So what it did is, by just having the conversation, it actually got the leadership to listen and say, we need to now start paying attention to the needs of our youth because what's happening is, or what could happen, is that we might see them just leave. Right? And that's, 
um, the, the sort of trend that uh, that Munir and I, in our discussion, we were talking about is, is, is this happening just within our community or is it actually something that we're seeing in churches and synagogues and maybe other faith groups where people are finding that because there's maybe some incompatibility with certain things or, you know, maybe services, as, as I mentioned, aren't quite what they um, expect, that they feel that they don't have a place in their particular um, center or, you know, faith um, uh, house of worship in their community. So we thought, why not bring this discussion, uh, you know, to this particular event and hear from our fellow panelists and see, do we have similar problems? You know, is there a generational divide? Are there things that we can learn from one another about how to uh, maintain or sustain our, our membership and, and avoid problems where people just feel like they don't have a need for faith anymore. And I think uh, when we hear from Manir um, and some of the research uh, that, that I'm excited to hear about, we'll, we'll, we'll have a really fruitful discussion. So I, um, I'm gonna now pass it along to my fellow panelists or, or to Manir if you would if you'd like to. Sure, thank you so much. All right, thank you, Sister Jose. So next we're going to hear from Rabbi Dr. Lawrence Milner. Milner. Yeah. Okay. Rabbi Milner is a rabbi at Congregation Beth Emick here in Pleasanton. He received his BA and his PhD at Brandeis University, where he was a recipient, recipient of a fellowship in the Center of Modern Jewish Studies. That's a research uh, institute devoted to social scientific study of American Jewelry. Rabbi Milner was ordained at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in New York and the Seminary of Reform Judaism and he also has pursued dual careers in rabbinics and uh, academia and he was an assistant professor at the University of Maine and a lecturer at Bangor Theological Seminary my goodness and thought, taught at the American Hebrew uh, Academy, Academy in Greensboro, North Carolina. He's also served at the Union for Reform Judaism as, as his director of social action for the New York New England region. I can keep going because it keeps going, but I'm, I'm like, I might have to fall on my hands. I feel like you're flying for the job. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. You got it. Rabbi, thank you. Okay. Uh, good evening and Ramadan Mubarak. Thank you. Thank you to the Muslim Community Center for your invitation to speak and to respond to Hosai. I consider this a great honor. It's my first time speaking here. And I do think in the 35 years I've been a rabbi, it's the first time I've been invited to speak in a Muslim uh, setting. Uh, so this is wonderful for me. Um, and I wish you blessings during the holy month of Ramadan. I hope that our congregations, Congregation Beth Emek and the Muslim Community Center, along with St. Bartholomew's Episcopal Church, uh, will continue to grow in understanding and in friendship. And this evening's topic really intrigues me when uh, Hosai wrote to us and said, you know, here's what I'm, I'm thinking about. She had a particular phrase that jumped out at me that I wasn't aware of because she says, you know, we have this uptick of worship attendance during Ramadan. And then it trails off, uh, and you, you use the term, uh, or maybe it was you, you yeah. used the term Ramadan Muslims. And, and <laughs> also you spoke, that, and in addition to the regraying of mosques after Ramadan. All this was new to me. Um, among Jews, we do have a similar, we have similar language. We refer to High Holy Day Jews. Um, that is those Jews who come to synagogue on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the Jewish New Year and the Day of Atonement, and whom we are unlikely to see the rest of the year. Um, and I, of course, knew about uh, twice a year Christians. <laughs> But uh, honestly, I had never thought about Ramadan Muslims. Um, and the question, as I understood the question in our communications, is how we all address within our respective religious traditions the phenomenon of religious observance that peaks around holidays and dissipates after. This is a little different than the specific uh, assimilation challenge that you discussed, but related. So let's start with the obvious. Guilt is an ineffective motivator when it comes to religious behavior. That's easy. No one is going to show up for the holidays if the sermon is, why aren't you here the rest of the year? Here is where I think I have a unique perspective. I am not a salesman for Judaism. I have not taken upon myself the task of convincing others to be more Jewishly engaged. Nor am I an evangelizer for Judaism, but on this point, I think Muslims and Episcopalians and Jews, we all think alike. 
We are not out to convert people, just to exemplify the best in our respective faiths. If a Muslim fasts and prays and gives a zakat, it demonstrates a commitment to faith that others may find admirable and perhaps attractive. Jews, non-proselytizing Christians, we all share the same approach. But that's not really the issue, is it? Because what makes religion worthwhile if it is not a set of expectations? Our faiths are, by definition, aspirational. To be a good Jew or Christian or Muslim means to strive for something. It's that internal dimension of jihad, or for Christians to live as Jesus would. What would our religions be without expectations? Hollow, or as Jews like to say, bagels and locks and the Sunday New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> Judaism has the concept of mitzvah, which means sacred obligation. For example, it's a mitzvah to light the Sabbath candles or to fast on Yom Kippur. It's also a mitzvah to give charity and to visit the sick. To be a Jew means to live with a sense of obligation. Now, as a liberal Jew, we call ourselves Reform Jews, that's our movement. I might not view those obligations the same way as my Orthodox counterparts do, but I share with thoughtful Jews the idea that Judaism is lived in dialogue with God. I am not alone. Jewish duty does not begin and end with me. <coughs> Were I to try discussing what those expectations are with my congregants, let's just say that our congregants are zealous with regard to their personal autonomy. <laughs> Indeed, personal autonomy may be the real faith of many American Jews. Now, I can't speak for other religions, but I would suggest that personal autonomy is one of those most highly American values. And this is where the rubber hits the road. Because in contrast to American values, our religions view spirituality as a collective enterprise. We are in this together. And that means that ultimately, we do not each individually define our own terms of what Judaism or Islam or Christianity actually requires of us. But religion as a shared enterprise is countercultural. It runs against the grain of American individualism and against the Western Enlightenment tradition as a whole. Here's what I mean. Three billion people watch the World Cup soccer finals. <laughs> there are two and a half billion Christians in the world. Soccer is more important to more people than any religion. <laughs> we should keep that in mind when we think about nominally observant members of our respective faiths. Being religiously identified at all in this postmodern world is going against the stream. There are at least as many Jews who don't show up for a high holy days as the ones who do. Secularization is a bigger issue than the phenomenon of High Holy Day Jews. We live in times when spiritual practice on any level is a countercultural act, bucking the trend. Now, in some ways, this is a, an even bigger problem for Jews than for Christians or Muslims, and that's just a reflection of the disproportionate participation of Jews in areas of society that have a highly secularizing influence university education, occupations that involve high rates of mobility, being uprooted from historically native Jewish lands. Many American Muslims can relate to the consequences of being uprooted, but none of these factors are particular to Jews. We are all being bombarded with messages that present non-observance of religion or no religion at all as the expected societal norm. So on this point, we probably all agree. Ramadan Muslims and High Holy Day Jews and Christmas Christians, we're glad they are here at all. <laughs> but 
I am not going to be able to change their behavior. I cannot sell Judaism in the marketplace of identities. I see us, at least Jews, as engaged in the creation of places that are truly holy, communities that aspire to be attuned to the sacred dimension of life, communities that care about one another, communities who feel called to repair a broken world. My gosh, that is an extraordinary level of commitment. Who joins such a community? Who gives their time and their resources to realize that shared vision? No amount of outreach programming or affinity groups or dare I admit it, inspiring sermons are going to get our co-religionists to beat a path to our door. What matters is the richness of our own practice of our faith. Are we generous? Are we ethical? Are we serious about our spiritual growth? Some Jews who are longing for an antidote to the enemy, the aloneness and spiritual vacuity of society will find sanctuary and meaning in the synagogue. But that will only be true if we are real and authentic in our respective faiths. If we try to sell ourselves, try to market our religion, we are no different than the ads we see on TV and probably a whole lot worse at it than they are. <laughs> so in the end, counterculture is where it's at. I was a countercultural Jew in the 1970s when that meant reimagining what Jewish life could be. I am a countercultural Jew now when it means that Judaism reimagines society in which we live. When it comes to the task we all face, I would guess that deeply committed Christians and Muslims feel the same way. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, yes. They don't clap when I do sermons. <laughs> Here at the Moscow, you say. Uh, here at the Moscow, I say it's not haram to clap. Haram is like something forbidden. So I always remind our congregation it's not haram. <laughs> All right, and our next speaker, our panelist, will be Rector uh, Andy Logan. Uh, Rector Logan was reared in Palo Alto. He received undergraduate degrees in physics and math at MIT and a master's in science and math education from UC Berkeley. For several years, he taught public high schools and colleges in uh, Chicago and San Antonio. In San Antonio, he felt God's calling to him to become an ordained minister. He also attended, then, then he attended the seminary of the Southwest in Austin. He then served as a, a year as a transitional deacon and new priest in San Antonio. That was followed by four years serving at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, beautiful place, and serving in many facets of that ministry, especially outreach, social justice, and interfaith work. We're so honored that you're here. And Rector Andy is now the priest in charge at St. Bartholomew's Church in Livermore. He lives in Oakland with his wife, Olga, and their two lovely daughters, light, lightly daughters, Lillian and Abby. Thank you so much. Thank you, and uh, assalamu alaikum, everybody. I hate being third in a panel like this because all the good points are taken. <laughs> um, but I think there is a little bit of uniqueness, uh, perhaps, to the Christian perspective on all this. Uh, the, the simple answer to the question that you, Sister Hassan, raised is yes. Um, it is very much an issue in churches, just as much as in synagogues and mosques, that we see a graying of the congregation um, and that we see some, some, I wouldn't even say cyclic, but spike patterns in attendance at certain points of the year, and then the rest of the year tends to be a, an ever-decreasing trough. Um, it took me a while to learn some of the jargon around this. In seminary, uh, it, I had to hear this three or four times before I knew what it meant when somebody would ask, so how many CEOs do you have in your church? Oh. Uh, chief executive officers? I mean, are we talking about J.P. Morgan Chase here? No, Christmas and Easter only. Uh, but it gets even better. There's another acronym, uh, HMDs. Hatch, match, and dispatch. So the ones you see only for baptisms, weddings, and funerals. Um, and we, we've got 
got plenty of those as well. And it, it doesn't surprise me. I am guessing, actually, that the, the HMDs might be a relatively unique feature to Christianity because we're at such a funny point societally. We're living with this rhetoric that's becoming ever increasingly hollow, that somehow this is a Christian nation and that those values and those teachings pervade our public life. And I think all of us, especially here in California, know that that is the language of a bygone colonial empire who, who, that has run its course and just no longer represents who we are as a people. And so we're in a new era where we need to reimagine who are we as a people, what holds us together, and how can we deal with the tensions and the differences among us in ways that build life and peace among our varying communities. But in the meanwhile, we still have this tiny little vestige, and so we have a large section of the population that says, you know, I can somehow squint hard enough and convince myself that it's the way it used to be and that my family is what it used to be if we just identify with a church maybe three, four times in a lifetime. And that's where we go to get married, that's where we take our babies when they're born to be baptized, and then that's where we bury our dead. Now, I don't have any sort of rancor toward this, and I certainly don't discourage people who come for that. But I also see that there's a little bit of a problem, and there's even a problem with the CEO. And my more fundamentalist brothers and sisters might say, well, the problem is that the faith is just not strong enough, and there may be some eternal consequences for that. I completely disagree with that, and I think that's a gross misreading of the scripture and the tradition. Here's, however, what I think the problem is. When Martin Luther King was able to stand on Washington Mall and say he had been to the mountaintop and he had seen the promised land, he could be relatively certain that the overwhelming majority of his audience had a context within which to put those words and he didn't need to connect all the dots for them. And that is more important than it might sound. See, as a priest in the church, I am encouraged to the point of almost required to maintain some disciplines that probably would have been fairly commonplace for a lay person in ages past. At least twice a day, I pray what's called the daily office, and part of that is a cycle of reading the Old and the New Testaments of Holy Scripture that bring me through the entirety of it every two years. At least every month or two, I go and see a fellow priest who um, is referred to as a spiritual director for pastoral counseling, direction, confession, if I feel that that's necessary. Again, these were fairly commonplace disciplines for most people who would have called themselves Christian in ages past. Now they are foreign to most. So what that means is that when we get those rare occasions, when we get the Christmas, when we get the Easter, we're reading a scripture and we're preaching a message where people have very limited context within which to put it. And you'd be amazed at what funky things people can do with sound bites when they don't have the context. We, we, we've never seen stuff like that happening. But all of this rhetoric that somehow cherry picks just a few proof texts from the Christian tradition and uses them to justify Islamophobia uses them to justify anti-Semitism, anti-immigrant rhetoric, uh, you know, pat, praise the Lord and pass the ammunition type of stuff. All of this becomes impossible when you understand the broader context. You can get it if you're willing to say, the only text I know is the one that bolsters my case, and, and it can be found, I will give you that, but I'm going to ignore the rest of the story. But if you actually become a regular practitioner, and I do indeed see it as a practice, and that practice involves regular reading, regular prayer, regular study, regular conversation in community, hopefully a community diverse enough that somebody will challenge your point of view, you no longer can stay in that place. It's not just something we need to do as an interfaith group, it's actually something we need to do within the confines of our own communities. And in that respect, I would have to agree with Rabbi Milder that even though it doesn't appear so on the surface, surface, being truly Christian is as countercultural in this day and age as being truly Muslim or truly Jewish would be. 
But it's a countercultural thing that I think is absolutely essential. So to just kind of round up the way Rabbi Milder did a little bit, the question is what to do about it. I am not an evangelist in the sense that I'm trying to get more people to come to church. I'm certainly not going to sell them, well, you've got to come to save your soul. I don't believe that myself. But what I am going to say is I believe in a God whose goal it is, in the words of the prophet Jeremiah, to remove the hearts of stone from our body and to replace them with hearts of flesh. And I know that's a text that we all share. And I'm going to suggest that when it's at its finest, the church is a community, a body of people, a living, breathing entity that gives power and gives a vessel and gives a means by which God can accomplish that noble goal. So anytime somebody is willing to hear, that is what I'm going to sell, because that's all I believe that we have to offer. And that's something I think that appeals as much to young as it does to old, as much to the completely secularized as to the devotedly religious. That's what we have to offer. Yeah. Thank you so much for the great panel. Great insights there. Uh, so what I'm hearing is, of course, the American religious landscape is undergoing a dramatic uh, transformation. And so I wanted to kind of throw some research in here before we kind of get into our discussion. Uh, there is this group called the Public Religion Research Institute, uh, PRRI, and they're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to uh, conducting independent research. And they're trying to figure out where the intersection of religion, culture, and public policy is. So in that little, if you think of a Venn diagram, they came up with some uh, nuggets that I just want to read real quick here. Uh, that it's from a 2016 American Values Atlas. So this was the single largest survey of American religious denomination and identity ever conducted. So uh, from this, uh, we found that white Christians now account for fewer than half of the public. Today, only 43% of uh, Americans identify as white and Christian, and only 30% as white and Protestant, which were the majority of before. In 1976, roughly 8 in 10, that's 81% Americans identified as white and identified with the Christian domination, and a majority of 50, 55% were white Protestants. Also, non-religious, non-Christian religious groups are growing, but they still represent less than 1 in 10 Americans combined. Jewish Americans constitute about 2% uh, of the public, while Muslims, Buddhists, and Hindus constitute only about 1% each of the public. All other non-Christian um, religions constitute an additional 1%. And amongst American youngest religious groups uh, are all non-Christian. The youngest religious groups are all non-Christian. Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists are all far younger than white Christian groups. At least one-third of Muslims, 42%, of Hindus, 36%, of Buddhists, 35%, they're under the age of 30. So that's roughly one-third, 34% of that are religiously unaffiliated Americans also, about one third, thirty-four percent, are religiously unaffiliated Americans and under thirty years old, thirty-four percent. So, if you contrast that with white Christians uh, groups, they're aging slightly more than one in ten. White Catholics, eleven percent. Um, I'll we'll skip that. And then atheists and agnostics account for a minority of all religious uh, unaffiliated. Most are secular. Atheists and agnostics account for about one third. That's twenty-seven percent of all religious unaffiliated Americans, and nearly 6 in 10, that's 58% religiously unaffiliated Americans, identify as secular, someone who is not belonging to a religious group. 16% of religiously unaffiliated Americans, nonetheless, report that they identify as a religious person. I just have a couple more here. Jews, Hindus, and Unitarian Universalists, they stand out as the most educated groups in the American religious landscape. More than one third of Jews, 34%, Hindus, 38%, and Unitarian Universalists, 43% hold postgraduate degrees. Notably, Muslims are significantly more likely than white evangelical Protestants to have at least a four-year degree, 33% versus 25%. Finally, the religious unaffiliated. This is a growing demographic. A third of adults under 30 have no religious affiliation. That's 32% of our population. And that's compared to with just one in 10 who are 65 and older. So just about 9% of people over 65 are religiously un unaffiliated. Today, young adults are much more likely to be unaffiliated than previous generations uh, who were at, the, at a similar stage in life. The growth in the number of religiously unaffiliated Americans, sometimes called the rise of the nuns, nuns, N-O-N-E-S, 
is largely driven by generational replacement, the gradual supplanting of older generations by newer generations. So amongst all this panel, uh, here's my question. How could each of the uh, faith groups represented here today make their representative faith more relevant to the younger generation, who are the largest subset responsible for the decline? Who wants to go first? <laughs> solve our problems. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Um, you know, echoing what I mentioned earlier, I think conversation and dialogue is the, the starting point. We have got to listen to each other, and we've got to um, give, uh, you know, roles of leadership to our youth, and I think the mosques that I've been a part of that I think are the most successful have a lot of youth activity. They have um, youth um, you know, leadership uh, leadership programs where, where youth are actually trained on how to, uh, you know, just uh, sort of come into their own identity, but also take the reins a little bit from the older generation. And uh, even here at the MCC, I'm very grateful to be a part of this community just within the past couple of months, but they have so many efforts to really try to bring as many youth in as possible. And I think as long as we can open that, those channels, then we have, we're, we're listening to them. We're actually, you know, um, giving them a space so that they don't feel that there isn't anything here for them or that it's antiquated the messages that they're getting and it's as was mentioned before like you know just something that, that doesn't necessarily appeal to them but they actually do find um, that, the, that the community um, does offer something that they that they're interested in and that they then they can be a part of so I think um, that's that's in my opinion the best thing that our community can do and I'm really happy to say that we have this wonderful community center that's uh, really doing that already but I, I my my hope is that this can be something that we just see continue to grow, that more and more youth programs, uh, programming for youth are created, and that more and more leaders um, are developed uh, within the youth. Well, that's a tough question, but as you were asking me, what came to mind was actually a conversation I had with one of our youth members a couple of years ago when I first started at St. Bartholomew's. And it wasn't so much a question as just a brain dump, but what she told me left my head spinning. I mean, she basically described a typical week for her at Livermore High School. And she uh, just said, you know, you'll look around and you'll see students who are experimenting with gender fluidity, and then you'll see the guys who are going by in a hot rod yelling out uh, words I will not repeat in the polite setting and telling them that they're going to hell. And then you will see, um, you know, a group of students who are sort of the, the ropers, you know, the cowboys, and then a cadre of students who very recently emigrated from uh, South Asian nations looking at them uh, kind of like one might regard somebody who'd come from another planet. And, and, you know, she went on and on, and at the end she basically just sort of sat back and said, what am I supposed to do with all of this? And it just... It's taken me a while to formulate or to even encapsulate what I think she was saying, which is basically our youth are living at an all-you-can-eat identity buffet now. <laughs> it is absolutely overwhelming, and it's getting more and more granular, and the pressures are higher and higher, like, be this way, no, be that way, and, you know, and there's a sense of... You, you better choose one or else you're not going to have any friends. I mean, you better figure out which tiny island in this huge sea you're going to inhabit so at least there's a few people on it with you. And I can understand how that could be incredibly anxiety-provoking and how we're seeing a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety, a lot of violence in youth culture. And it seems to me like, what, and I, I don't know how to do it yet, so this is my, my prayer right now, but what the religious groups can do is rather than offering our island, you know, offering an identity on that all-you-can-eat buffet, because what makes us any more appealing than any of the others, rather offering a way to transcend that altogether and a place where you, you don't have to play that game. You can simply be yourself, be before God, and know that you are loved and you can love others and do that in a place of, of not being judged and not being forced to pick from this overwhelming smorgasbord. Well, I think it goes without saying that we could program for youth. I'm a product of the youth group of my movement and that's where I got really excited about, about my own Jewish identity. There's always more you can do to program for youth. Um, I think that we jump to some conclusion 
uh, prematurely if we think that the solution for attracting youth to being more engaged is to focus on them. Because of what they see is that the adults are not coming and participating, then they may be very engaged with their youth group activities and their peer-led activities and get very excited about those things, but that doesn't translate into a sense of belonging to an adult community uh, further down the road. So uh, the evidence is right before them, and the solution is not them, the solution is us. The solution is the religious community that we create, which is, includes them. They are a part of that religious community, but we can't pretend that, that we can separate them and program for them and get them to be more committed than we are. Wonderful, thank you for that. So, um, one of the youth came into my office recently, and they're, they're uh, you know, I always talk about gray heads versus uh, black heads at the mosque here. Like, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, in our, after Ramadan, we, the gray heads start coming back. And I guess my, myself, she said, um, you know, I've got salt and pepper going, so I'm kind of between the two of them. It's probably a George Clooney look. <laughs> I really felt great. So what I'm curious about is, uh, what would you estimate is the average age of your attendees in your congregation? And I think I'll, I'll kind of say just about this congregation, it really depends on the service of the congregation. So with our youth services, obviously we're getting youth there, but they're they're around 16, 17, and we have to, it's the polite word, bribe them with, with pizza. pizza. Uh, <laughs> works. Works, yes. Uh, but with the other with the others, uh, you know, our average age, I'd, I'd say, is around 40, 40 to 45 is, is what we're getting at our in our Friday sermons, um, is what we're seeing. So I'm curious what would be in other nominations. Um, well, we're a relatively small congregation, so uh, we have a fair number of families with children, and if they show up, that drops the average age tremendously. So I really can't give a number. Uh, we certainly are, are, for the most part, an aging denomination. Um, our church has been seeing a little bit more youth recently. What I can say, however, is the age group that's conspicuously absent and that is 19 to about 35. Yeah. We have almost nobody in that bracket. So there, more to be said about that, but. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right, but of course that's because uh, our congregations are Pleasant and Livermore based, they're not in Oakland. And the, the age profile would be different were we in a more urban, Part of the Bay Area. I'm looking at the lay leaders in my congregation here for for guesstimates on the average age. But let's let's lop off the special services, the religious school class services, the you know family service night when yeah the age, the age drops or a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah. We're going to bring in a lot of families and relatives, and again going to drop the age. But outside of that, you know I've, I've actually never done that kind of analysis of the age profile of people who attend. Um, and if I had to hit an average, maybe I would say 50. Do you think that that's fair? Fair? Uh, from the, um, we're talking average here. It's, it's a, you'd be upwards of that. So that's pretty old. It's really, I mean, younger than me, but it's still, I mean, this is not a young profile. Uh, I'm sorry, I just uh, wanted to add one more thing because you mentioned our suburban setting. So I, I served at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, and the answer there is quite different, but it is really phenomenal as you look at a typical week there. So on Sunday, there are three main services. The 830 service is liturgically probably, well, it's tied with the 11 o'clock for the most conservative, but it's much quicker and much quieter, and the median age there is probably above 60. And then the 11 o'clock service, median age is probably above 50, and that's the really traditional one that sort of mirrors a large mass from one of the Church of England cathedrals. Um, we're more British than the British over there. <laughs> but then you've got the 6 o'clock evening service where there's no organ. Um, it is, you know, it's piano and bells and harp and things like that. It meets on the labyrinth, not in the pews. Um, and the, the liturgy is much more flexible. There, I'd say the median age is more like high 30s to low 40s, but then Tuesday night, there's a little program that started off with 30 people who asked if they could, 
I don't know if rent the space or use the space for free, and put their yoga mats down on a Tuesday yeah, night. Yeah, yeah. And they did this for a little while, and then 30 quickly turned to 60, yeah. which tur quickly turned to 100. And pretty soon, the not just the cathedral clergy, but the bishop of the diocese yeah. caught attention to this and said, you know what, we, we need to do something with this. And so it said, keep doing it, but there's going to be a sermon that's part of it. You need to... <laughs> So now 800 people, all of whom are pretty much between 20 and 45, gather every Tuesday knowing full well that they are going to hear a sermon with pretty distinctly Christian content. Um, and a yoga instructor who actually uh, did as much training in the Catholic Church as he did at an ashram. That says something. <laughs> I'm so glad you shared that, but it, because I think it does sort of, um, you know, expand on, on the power that we have, right, to, to change programming to appeal to people who might have different interests. I've seen that too in some mosques where they offer martial arts classes, or just classes that are not necessarily religious, but just provide that sense of community, which is, I think, the, the greatest thing that typically our, our different groups have always offered people, right? That there's a sense of belonging, that they can come with their family, um, with their friends, and just commute with other like-minded people. And so looking at programming, diversifying programming, I think, is a great way to, um, again, empower us to say, yes, we can, um, we can maybe um, change this trend that we're seeing. So I'm glad you shared that. All right, good. So I think I'll move on to something else. So membership goes with money. I mean, we talk about uh, you know the, the churches, how they got sustained. Have mosque, he funds to do this, and so we'll, at this mosque at least we use membership. So how much membership can you get? And that's how we sustain ourselves. So what services are lacking uh, as a mosque that you or any religious group that you think might promote membership and help sustain existing memberships? Uh, if you have that model up here. That are lacking. Um, you know, to be honest, I can't speak from 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 this particular center. I'm relatively new, but again, just from the things that I've heard from other community members, I think um, more uh, social services, you know, would be ideal. One of the things that I do think is very commendable about church groups is that. Um, if you did, I, I, I remember recently doing a search for different support groups for people, for someone who was uh, in need of a support group, and I went through this menu. I think um, it was just a general menu for, to find support groups in the area, and almost every single support group I found was actually um, done at a church, and I thought that was amazing. Like you know, that's something that our mosque could definitely do, just to provide a space, for example, for people who have maybe drug dependency issues and want to you know, meet with other people, or who've lost someone who are coping with uh, you know, a recent death, maybe they need support, um, or divorce uh, support groups, but just things that the community, again, uh, people in the community might really benefit from, but to be able to do those types of meetings at the mosque, I think would be really great. So that's definitely something that, um, you know, I guess I'll tell Munir right now, <laughs> if there's a suggestion box I can write it to, but about, about the suggestion box. Thank you. So glad you brought up that question. Um, in the Episcopal Church, at least, we do not have a membership system as you describe. As a matter of fact, we uh, we would be severely disciplined by our uh, ecclesiastical authorities were we to try something like that. So all giving is entirely free will. Now that being said, regular attenders are, are highly encouraged to do what's called tithing, uh, which is kind of get as close as possible to... Uh, to 10% of gross income, but recognizing that, you know, that, that's a big stretch for some people and not so big a stretch for others. But, um, that being said, as with so many churches of our size, last year St. Bartholomew's found itself in a completely unsustainable financial position. Uh, we started the year with a deficit that was nearly a third of our annual budget. Um, and we had less money than that in, in our savings account. So we, uh, we were literally in a position of do something different or close your doors. Uh, what that ended up resulting in after uh, looking around for other options uh, for most of the year was a new partnership with a different church in Livermore, uh, St. Matthew's Missionary Baptist Church. It just so happened, and I, I actually don't believe it just so happened. I think you know God was involved in this in some ways 
had to find a new home and we had a space that was just right for them. So um, they moved over to our space. This really solved a financial problem for both congregations, but it also just opened our eyes to a way of being that we never would have considered otherwise, because St. Matthew's is overwhelmingly African-American, St. Bartholomew's is overwhelmingly Anglo-American, the Baptist Church is pretty radically Protestant, the Episcopal Church is the most Catholic of the Protestant denominations, and all of a sudden, on the same campus, um, largely voluntarily, but sometimes by force, we have these two groups where black and white are being forced to talk to each other and learn about each other and get along with each other and share space and share resources, Protestant and Catholic dialogue. And the whole neighborhood is looking and saying, what? This never happens. Like, these are groups of people who are supposed to not even be able to stand each other, and here they are standing arm in arm and smiling and, you know, um, moving back and forth between their two sanctuaries on Sunday morning. This is just amazing. So it's not just even the internal change, but the external change. And I'm realizing that, in a way, the cart may have driven the horse in that a financial need forced us to do this. But now I'm realizing that it's this sort of cross-cultural and ecumenical cooperation that could actually be what ends up being the financial salvation of um, not just ours, but a lot of religious groups and that financial salvation is actually a byproduct. The real deal is we're finally breaking down some barriers that have divided us for way too long. Um, I'm fascinated that the Muslim Community Center operates on a due system. This is this is news to me, and I'm really interested in learning more about you know comparative financial models of religious institutions. It's a fascinating subject for those of us who do it day in and day out. Um, uh, there is no good solution for us. We, um, you asked the question, what could we do that would uh, help uh, attract more? Well, um, there's no one single program that's going to do that. Uh, what we do say about our identity is we call Congregation Beth Emick the Center for Jewish Learning, Prayer, and Community in the Tri Valley. And actually, I think that we do. Um, a very good job of, uh, of education, both for adults and children. We, I think our services are, are enriching. Uh, when it comes to community, well, we're involved in the community. We do a number of social service projects and we're very active with the Interfaith, uh, with uh, Interfaith Interconnect and, and, and that. But um, where we don't attract people are all those Jews out there who say, my Judaism is social justice. I'm not so sure about God. I really, you know, um, uh, I'm, I'm not coming to your adult ed classes. I want to, I want to change the world, and that's what I think Judaism is. And for those people, we're not presenting the options of we're an activist uh, congregation that that stands for um, particular values in the broader world that we want to see enacted and, and engage people. Those people aren't, aren't really getting what they need out of the congregation. There's a programmatic area that we can develop more. So I just have... All right, I just have one final question because this is an interfaith event and an interfaith iftar. Um, and then we'll open up for Q&A in the audience. We're about uh, T minus 20 minutes, looks like. I'm going to put Sister Jose on the spot and give us a little primer on Ramadan after we do Q and A here before we head into the banquet hall. But I do, I do want to ask, as as representative of the three Abrahamic faiths, how can we work? These three groups work together to promote promote a God centered life in in the world where people are suffering from unprecedented amounts of mental health crises, drug, alcohol dependencies, pornography addiction, just a multitude of problems. How can we, as people of faith, work on that? Go ahead. <laughs> that was probably the hardest question you've asked all the evening. Um, I think I'd keep my answer short. 
which is to be unafraid to keep God in it when we meet as interfaith. I mean, one thing I, I recently shared with my congregation is that I often find ecumenical engagement to be more tricky and more sort of emotionally challenging than interfaith. And the reason is because with ecumenical engagement, we're starting from the assumption that we're using the same source material, the same set of scriptures, the same traditions, the same history. Whereas with interfaith engagement, we're much more broad-minded in saying, no, actually, we're coming from different source material, and so we're much more comfortable with the tensions and differences among us. But I think sometimes we go so far as to say we forget the faith part of interfaith, and that actually, at some kernel level, we still have the same source material. And I think if the world can see that we, we hearken to that, and that we're willing to hold in loving tension all the differences that spring out of that, that's a really powerful witness. Amen to that. I am uh, I'm convinced that when we do these events, when people see the religious communities who uh, talk to one another in uh, out of deep respect, and deep acceptance and appreciation and recognize that it takes nothing away from our respective faiths, then other people go, oh, religion is cool. They know how to get along. The rest of the world, they don't know how to get along with one another. But those people of faith, they really understand how to respect one another and respect differences. So much. I really appreciate what both of you said in your earlier comments about um, just really living our faith and being true to our faith and being the best that we can in terms of um, practicing our faith. And I think uh, if we can do that, you know, and, and as uh, to, to again um, share what you said about just really um, keeping God in the conversation, being proud of our identity, I think this is um, the best thing that we can all individually do. So thank you. Uh -huh. Round of applause to our panel. Thank you so much. We're going to go around right now to confidence questions. Oh, we'll just use this mic. You should go and raise your hand. Oh. Hi, my name is Tui. Thank you so much for uh, coming to speak today. So um, I'm part, I hate to use this word, but I'm part of the millennial generation, and I do see um, mm -hmm a great shift of people who are not religious in um, my particular culture and like I think that uh, is due to well what I've observed is that uh, people well in our age are more into themselves and not wanting to look out for their like like you know their peers because they want to get ahead like what would you do in your particular um, religions um, to like grow that in this community. <laughs> Let me make sure I uh, I understood your question. So you're talking about sort of speaking to a generation that has has become considerably more individualistic in its its view of itself and and sort of broaden that. Yeah, like um, people are more like you know, well, in our age group want to you know just like <laughs> thank you do things that you know get them ahead in life and you know they don't really look for you know look for the taking care of others or like you know their neighbors like say hi to your neighbor is like <laughs> like not seen anymore like how would you inspire that in our like generation I, personally i might go a route that might surprise a lot of people which is i'd start in doing something that um, apparently is actually national practice in the country of Bhutan. And that's something along the lines of a happiness assessment. And the reason I would do that is because I am convinced that in this generation that's absolutely obsessed with sort of getting ahead at the expense of everyone and everything else, 
the level of happiness is lower than it's ever been in the Western world, at least. Um, and I think there's kind of, obviously, if you confront people head on with that, you're going to get a defensive reaction. But I think there's some backdoor ways to begin that conversation. I think once it's begun, the logical mind can see that actually we're much more mutually interdependent than we think we are, and that our happiness, which I would hope is actually the true goal of just about every human being, is entirely dependent on looking out for the good of a larger group than just one. Um, so in a way, I would almost not use a particularly religious argument, but more of, of a rational one to sort of start to address that. And I, I think a rational one that is entirely in line with our religious teachings. Well, thank you guys for coming out and talking to us. Um, one thing that I found um, just growing and moving into the city from like suburbs and just growing in my career, that more and more we're around people who don't respect the idea of believing in God in general. So whether you're Christian, Jewish, or Muslim, um, and there's a lot of comfort that can be found from finding other Christians or Jewish people around you that you guys believe in God in the workplace and you can kind of discuss it or talk about it. What are we doing in respective communities to kind of inspire others to kind of band together outside of our religious norms of coming to our mosques or churches or synagogues? <laughs> I think we kind of addressed that right in that very last question where we talked about you know how can we work together to promote a more God-centered life. So I think that's uh, you know um, something that we should do is just to be more outspoken about our faith. Yes, it's countercultural to be religious. Yes, it's perceived to be something um, you know again not in line with modernity or science. <laughs> to have faith in God, but I think the more we're proud of our faith, and we don't necessarily push it on anybody, but we're just ready, you know, we're, we're willing to share it instead of hide it, I think that promotes and fosters more, more conversation and dialogue and understanding. So for example, right now it's Ramadan, and I think um, I did a, a, a uh, a session with new uh, Muslims and, and someone mentioned that he loved Ramadan because it was a great time to actually share his faith. People would find out that he was fasting and then, you know, they would ask all these questions and it's, you know, but, but he, uh, he welcomed those questions. So I think we as people of, of, of faith should be obviously open to dialogue, but also look for opportunities maybe around holidays, you know, when we do see these uh, these trends and people are talking about it, Christmas obviously is a great time to talk about, you know, what church are you going to, what service are you going to attend, you know, just to be a little bit more proud and outspoken or, um, and Passover, you know, same thing. Just to kind of, again, share uh, maybe something that you learned if you did attend a service instead of feeling that you're, um, by doing so, that you're, you're, you're trying to, to convert someone. I think that message is, is not true. Uh, it's because, it's a, a, you know, that's based on intention. And if your intention isn't to do that, but rather to just share a part of you, then I think people should be more receptive to that. But unfortunately, we've gotten, I think, into this mindset that just by even sharing our faith identities, that it's going to be perceived as though we're trying to force it onto someone. But who's, who's giving that message, you know, I, I don't think that's coming from us. I think that's, uh, you know, we're being tar you know, that, that's a way to shut us up. And so we kind of have to, I think, push back on that notion. I agree. Mm -hmm. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a question today concerning the current Middle East situations. Um, there's a very famous uh, prophet called uh, Albert Pine. He forecast foresee that the Third World War will be between Islamic uh, and the West and Israel. And uh, so, well, many people know about, about I think this. So, what what are your opinions or you you foresee about this? <laughs> yes. 
I'm, I'm not familiar with with this particular writer uh, or or those ideas. Um, I know that I don't worry about the Third World War. That it's not on my. It doesn't weigh heavily on me. I do worry about our country, and I worry about what kinds of things our country might do. And I have deep concern about other countries as well. And just because we're American doesn't mean we can't care about the ethics and the justice practiced by other countries. Um, do I worry about some apocalyptic vision of the world and some cataclysmic conflict, uh, some Armageddon? Nope. I, I don't share that particular fear, but I do share concern about the choices we make as a country, and those concerns come from a place of faith. Okay. Let's do one or two questions. Um, I think this gentleman right here. Um, I'm not particularly certain if this is the setting under which to ask this question, so I encourage you to scrap it if you feel like it's inappropriate for this kind of panel. Um, but just out of kind of like an educational curiosity, um, how do each of you view religion in general? Like, is it more of a timeless set of beliefs um, that doesn't change, or is it more of an evolving culture that um, maintains core values? I think that was entirely appropriate to this setting. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll answer very quickly so uh, everybody has. Um, my view, and it's not a view that's shared by, by all Christians, but I adhere to it quite strongly, is I would, I would say it's a both and. To what you said, I, the word I would really use is it's a practice. Mm -hmm. um, it, there is a core of a timeless set of beliefs as you worded it. Um, I think it's a much smaller core than, um, than many people ascribe to it, but it's also a lifeless core until it actually receives wings from the person studying it and questioning it and practicing it um, and bringing it into community and into dialogue with others. From the Islamic perspective, Islam um, is a way of life, uh, and we definitely believe that it is um, that there's uh, the, the the religion as it is. It's been preserved for over 1,400 years, and um, this idea of reform or change. Um, it's kind of a slippery slope, and so uh, I would, we wouldn't necessarily, I think from the Orthodox view, use those terms as opposed to a dialogue and really, you know, um, looking at concerns that, that emerge with each, uh, you know, passing of time, what's, if, uh, you know, if there's something that's happening in a certain, um, you know, um, um, uh, time and place, that those things are addressed in the context that they need to be addressed, but not necessarily to alter the faith or change the faith in any way, because we believe that Islam is preserved and it doesn't need a reformation or a change. But that doesn't mean that, you know, that things, as I said, that emerge because of, uh, of you know, changing um, times aren't to be addressed. They absolutely are to be addressed from from the scholars and from the um, the people who are equipped to make those um, you know assessments, but other than that, this idea of of it changing or evolving with the time is not something that most Muslims um, ascribe to. Mm -hmm. We're five minutes away from iftar, so I am going to say just one short question and then go. Oh, thanks, Rabbi. Oh, I'm sorry. Your questions are good. Uh, sorry about that, Rabbi. You talked about what you call the third space, so I'm guessing the first space is like the kind of liturgical space and the second space is none, so the third space is like maybe in Episcopal language we call it the emerging church. Uh, can you talk more about like how um, each of your entities draws in those communities, um, whether it be about like um, kind of hot issue authors I know in the emerging church or like in Judaism, I know there's a podcast that I listen to that um, talks about Zionism, but also cultural Judaism and how they can come together and have the same conversation. I don't know as much about um, Muslim communities, so can you talk about how you draw in those those third spaces into your um, dialogues? Um, I'd like to change the, the uh, way we think about that language because third space is a particular term used by certain academics in a very precise way. The first space is home, the second place is work, the third space is where you go for a meeting that's neither home nor work. Now that is a very common 
uh, um, term that's used by a lot of academics to describe relationships. People seek out relationships in addition to home and work. But those relationships may happen at the gym. They're going to happen at the bar. They could happen at the, you know, the the um, the particular. Um, you you always go uh, out. Uh, you play bridge once a week. Whatever it might be. People have communities that they build. Synagogues, churches, mosques are third spaces. They are the third spaces in people's lives for those people who feel embedded in them. In this sense, the alternatives to synagogues, box, the the you know the Jewish communities, the Chavaran movement, but whatever the the places Muslims go that isn't the mosque is also a third space. In that sense, it's no different than the mosque. It's a place people go for meaning, in addition to the primary places that that we all occupy. We've all got it, but it's not the same for all of us. I say something fairly similar to Rabbi Milder. Um, I, I actually do take issue with sort of the third space language because um, I think in the words of uh, C.S. Lewis, an Anglican scholar from last century, he said, you know, Christianity has to be either overwhelmingly first or not at all. Mm. And his point being, not, not, not to shake a stick at people, but rather to say, you don't need God any less when you're peeling potatoes at your sink and preparing dinner for your family or when you're sitting at desk working all day than you do when you go to church on Sunday morning. So they're really, if, if you are seeking that meaning, that transcendence, that divine presence in your life at all, seek it everywhere and in all your spaces and all your settings and all your times. Um, and so I would say, you know, my goal as a minister is to try to facilitate that for people, you know, to, to decompartmentalize and deprofessionalize the religion and make it something that is tangible and practicable 24-7. As you're giving your answer, Sister Rose, if you just kind of give us a personal reflection on what Ramadan means to you. I know the brochure has a lot of information, sure. academic in there, but if you could just give a personal sure. out. Um, just to answer your question about the third space, as I mentioned, it sort of emerged from a need that people had um, that who felt that they didn't have a place in the mosque. But um, I think, um, you know, to address, uh, you know, again, this is completely based on, on my experience, um, the, the people who, who, um, who, who sought out third spaces are people who maybe were looking for um, a more progressive sort of identity as a Muslim, and they felt that by coming into mosques where there's, you know, more expectation to sort of, you know, follow certain rules and, and there's, you know, certain um, parameters that they wanted to be kind of free from that. Um, and so, you know, the, the places that I've been to are, uh, there's a motto, for example, in one of them that says, come as you are to Islam as it is. So it's like an open door policy. You can come regardless of whether you're Sunni or Shia, whether um, you are new to the faith or you've been practicing for a long time, whether you wear the hijab, for example, if you're a Muslim woman, or you choose not to. So it's really very open-minded and it's, uh, you know, it doesn't, there, there, are, there aren't as many restrictions. And so I think that's the model that's worked. And a lot of people really appreciate that because um, they, uh, they do find uh, that there is a place of non-judgment, that there's a place where they can just be themselves, and um, you know, uh, and and so um, that, that doesn't mean to say though that they don't still you know come to the mosques. I think it's just a an, an, an additional space that they can go and find that that sort of again uh, sense of belonging to. Okay. We'll have you talk outside. Oh sure, you, over there. Yeah. Okay, okay, there you go. Thank you.